first weekend before the first week of New Year's. And we're going to be getting ready to plow our garden in from the winter and pull out last year's garden and do a number of other things, including uh, go through our seeds from last year, look at the seed catalogs, make lists and place our orders and plan our garden out. So that's all part of it. Right now I'm going to show you. We've got a nice little Kubota tractor here. I've had this tractor for about 15 years. I bought it new and uh, it served me well. It doesn't take a lot of hours to do what I need to do. 15 seasons of gardening and I've got uh, 561 hours on her. So uh, she runs real well. This is a 28 horse diesel Kubota. I bought the diesel uh, because it puts out a little bit more torque and uses less fuel. That's not to say that a gas powered tractor is a bad tractor. They're just fine too. Tractors are a lifetime investment. Uh, whether you rent one, lease one, or you purchase one, there are plenty of used tractors out there for sale. If you have a large plot that you need to maintain, they're great to have. Uh, they're great workhorses. They get a lot of work done in a short amount of time. They allow you to multiply your effort and get way more work done uh, than you would otherwise be able to do with a walk behind tiller and things of that nature, especially if you're doing a large plot like I have which is a couple of hundred a little over a couple hundred feet long and uh, 80 feet wide now this tractor I currently have my Harrah's set up on here this is what they call a single row tractor its stance between the wheels is about the width of one row uh, from furrow to furrow which is the uh, walking path or blank area in between your raised hills these Harrah's have uh, four sets of uh, discs on them and I have them set at an offset against each other so that they'll till the soil and pull it into the middle from both sides and kind of turn everything in on itself as the harrows cut the vegetation to pieces and fluff the soil and turn it in towards the middle. These here and those there are set at, at the back ones are set this way and the front ones are set this way and like I said they end up turning the soil in towards the middle and creating a little bit of a hill the faster you go the bigger the hill it makes the slower you go the slower the hill um, but that's basically how these work they're just big round concave discs and the edges of them are fairly sharp there's a nice little edge on there not like a knife blade sharp but sharp enough to cut and break the vegetation and bust it up so it can compost down in the soil and build our soil um, there's the power takeoff under there for running uh, powered equipment like a rotary cutter or a big bush hog which I have also tractors pretty simple to operate you have a shift down here with your gears there is a high low lever here so you've got a low end range and then a higher end range. The low end runs first, second, third, and fourth at a slower speed with more torque, more pulling power, but lower speed. And if you switch it to the high end, pull up, push the clutch in and pull up on this lever, then your first, second, third, and fourth run with a little less torque, but a higher forward speed. This lever down here turns the PTO back there on and off to drive powered equipment like the bush hog and so forth. Um, Headlights and flashers are there, standard steering wheel, RPM meter, and then over here is the lift lever to control the, uh, the, the lift in the back that picks up and drops the harrows or whatever else you happen to be pulling behind you. I also have a, uh, a pull behind uh, planter that you can put different plates in to uh, plant different types of seeds. There's a clutch pedal, just like you would have in an automobile. And then over here you have two throttles on a tractor. You have the foot throttle, which is a little little pedal right here that you can run the uh, run the throttle with. And then here's a throttle stop lever. This throttle stop lever can actually set the idle speed wherever you want it. And the reason that's important is at the bottom end, when you let go of the clutch, the engine's not running fast enough to actually pull the tractor forward. It'll stall out. So what you do here is you set, depending on how heavy the equipment is you're carrying behind you, and yourself I suppose, you can set this throttle up a little bit so that when you let go of the throttle down here, the foot pedal, it'll only throttle back to the level you set so that when you still have the clutch out and you pick up your implement, you've got enough forward speed and torque to pull forward and turn around and then you can use your foot pedal to throttle back up once you drop the implement and start plowing. Another thing you have here is a split brake pedal. The purpose of this 
is you have a right brake and a left brake. When you're not needing to turn left and right, you can lock these two pedals together and they operate as a single brake, locking both wheels at the same time. But this allows you, when you're making a right hand turn, you can push on this pedal a little or a lot and lock this right wheel up and it'll allow you to turn this tractor on a dime or in a tighter circle depending on how hard you want to turn. Uh, the left pedal does the same thing with the left side. The last thing that's on here is a, uh, well there's two more things. This is your, your kill switch. This is what you pull up to shut the engine off. This is a diesel so just turning off the ignition won't do it. You actually have to kill the motor. This little dewey here underneath my seat controls the amount of uh, or how the amount of pressure that's in the lift system. So depending on the weight of the implement that I have on the back of the tractor, I can adjust this so that when I lower it, when I lower it or raise it, it won't just slam it on the ground. It'll let it down nice and slow. And I can adjust the speed that things are let down or, or picked up right here with this little pressure gauge. Now there's one last little dewey on here which is this lever right here. Your foot, is, your foot is in this area here, running the throttle and the brake. You can catch this when the clutch is depressed with the heel of your foot and push it down. And then when you let out on the clutch and gear, it will lock the differential between these two wheels. So uh, just like on a car that has a limited slip differential, if you're getting stuck or bogged down and one wheel is spinning and the other one's not, you can push the clutch in push this lever down, release the clutch, and what that'll do is lock these two wheels together so that the one that isn't bogged down will help to pull you out of the hole or the trench that you're digging for yourself. So that's a differential lock. And uh, that's pretty much all it is. You can see the, the rabbit and the tortoise there for the low and high lever. And that's pretty much all there is to this tractor. Um, obviously we have a, uh, a fuel filter there for the diesel fuel, oil filter there for the oil, and if you take this panel off right here, there's a dipstick to check the oil. And there's a couple of lubrication spots on this tractor, a couple up here on the pivot points on the steering, and also on the uh, wheel itself. And then there's a couple of linkages in here that have some grease fittings on them. And then back here, the Harrah's all have grease fittings on them. When I'm finished with the Harrah's, I always wash them off. Uh, with a garden hose to get all the dirt and stuff off them to prevent uh, corrosion and infiltration of dirt into the seals. And then I grease them to force any dirt that did press up against the seals back out of the system. And uh, that's basically how you maintain the Harrah's. Other than that, it's a pretty simple process. We're going to use this tractor today to plow in uh, the fall and, and uh, winter weed and, and uh, cover growth. And we're going to pull the old garden out and uh, plow all of that in also. We also have an old strawberry patch from about three to five years ago that's been sitting fallow that's got six foot weeds in it. We're going to pull all of that out of there. We're going to use the harrows to break it down. And then we're going to go in and pull all of the plastic out and uh, then plow all that in to get this garden ready for this season. And one other nice thing is I've got a bumper here. When I go to pull the, the plastic out of the covered rows, I can get it started and pull it back about seven or eight feet and then wind it up and wrap it around here and tie it and actually use the strength of the tractor to pull that plastic out of the garden. It saves me a lot of back breaking labor. You still got to jump on and off the tractor when the when the plastic tears and things of that nature to retie it on there. But it's a whole lot easier than dragging 75 feet of plastic out of a garden that's covered with dirt on both sides with nothing but uh, manual labor. So anyhow we're going to get to that. We're going to plow the garden, show you more about that, get everything pulled out and we're going to also do a segment uh, either in this video or a separate one on uh, prepping, uh, taking inventory and getting our seeds ready and our orders ready and how we track all of that to plan our garden out for 2014. So stay tuned. Okay, I want to take one quick minute here as a final minute to talk about safety. We talked about all the features of the tractor, but we did not discuss safety. Safety is primary. It's very important. These machines are fun to drive. Uh, they get a great amount of work done. But it is a 28 horsepower machine with a lot of heavy weight to it. It can crush you if it falls on you. It can run you over and kill you. This machine, think about it in terms of 28 horses stomping on top of you or 28 horses dragging you. That's what this machine can do. Um, the two most important safety features on this machine, first and foremost, are the seat belt. The seat belt will keep you in the seat. 
If the machine rolls over, it keeps you from falling out of the machine and getting crushed, drugged, or run over and killed by the machine. So staying in the machine in a rollover is of paramount importance and the safety belt, the seat belt, will do that for you. Secondly, you have the roll bar. Now I've got a sun canopy hooked to my roll bar, but that's not what the roll bar is there for. The roll bar is actually there, and I'm going to back up here where you can see it. It actually comes out, you can see where it's hooked to the tractor here, and it comes up and goes out around the fenders. So it creates a, 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 a safe zone in here, which is where you are if the tractor rolls over. The main important thing is while you're on the tractor, you want to keep your hands on the steering wheel. Tight down as hard a grip as you can, and you want to keep your feet inside the machine. You want, there's a foot pad, let me get my shadow out of here so you can see it. There's a foot pad on both sides of the transmission. You want to keep your feet clamped against either side of the transmission, pull your knees together, lock your hands on the steering wheel if you feel the machine going over. Once the machine comes to a stop, only then do you want to relax turn off the engine and then find a way to climb off the machine. As long as you stay in this area physically, the seat belt holding you in, keeping your hands and your feet inside the machine, the roll bar here is wider than your shoulders, it'll create a safe zone in this area right here if you'll stay in it until the machine comes to a stop, you can safely shut the engine off and get off the machine. That's what's important. Then you worry about getting the machine up, rotted, and seeing if it's damaged. And uh, that's basically our safety tip. I can't tell you enough to emphasize this. Many people are killed, farmers that have been farming since they were kids, many people are killed every year by these machines. So they're very powerful, um, they're wonderful tools, they're fun to use, but you do have to respect them or they'll rise up and bite you. Now you can see I've just finished plowing this one little section that's right behind my little uh, future workshop and where we store the Camaro and whatnot. And uh, anyhow, we pulled the dirt from this far end back this way and then went all the way back around to come the same direction each time. I'm not plowing in both directions, and the reason for that is, over the years, when you plow this, dire this direction over and over again to the left, it creates a low spot back here because the dirt gets pulled this way and you wind up with a high spot up here. So I've been going, I've been going around to the end of the garden and starting here, plowing down, picking up my harrows, using the brake to turn sharp here at the building, and then going all the way back around to the head to do the rows several times. And what I'm doing is over the course of this season, I'll pull this high spot back down here and fill in this low area. It was even lower than this before I started. It's already filled in some. So really, when you plow both directions, it helps to uh, spread the dirt out in the garden even. If you plow the same direction over and over again, it'll pull the dirt to one end and leave you with a low spot. Now, the other thing I'm doing is just beyond this area here, you see here, I'm starting here and I'm coming down and I'm plowing in this direction also one way because I've got a high spot up here from plowing this direction where I have not been plowing this area here because this was an old strawberry patch. There's plastic mulch in there and uh, it's overgrown with weeds. So I'm starting at this end down here, plowing down, picking up my harrows and just letting them rest on top of the hill and running on down to, to mash the, and break these weeds that have grown for a couple of years in so I can pull all this plastic out and then I'm gonna plow that area too because this area right here from here back up to the front of the Camaro shed is where we're gonna plant our artichokes this year. We're gonna try to grow artichokes. That's a new thing for us that so you'll be learning with us in the southeast Georgia area uh, what works and uh, apparently uh, we'll probably have some failures too and we'll show you what doesn't work. But anyhow, I'm going to work my way across the garden. You'll see more in a little minute. Okay, well, you can see this area here, which is right beside my uh, workshop shed. And this is where we had a strawberry patch about four or five years ago. And that patch lasted for three years, which is about the lifespan of strawberries. And then you have to either replace the plants in the same hills, or what most people do is pull it all out, uh, amend the soil, rehill it, plant new plants. You can save the plants from the runners and do that. But we decided to move our strawberries to the front of the garden and abandon this spot. And it has sat here for two, I think maybe three seasons. And the weeds were six foot, seven foot tall. And uh, it was a daunting task. I kept putting off, getting in there, pulling it out because it was so overgrown. But as you can see, I started at the head, plowed with the harrows, and then picked the harrows up, just let them ride on top of the hill 
to knock everything down. So that big forest of six foot tall weeds is all knocked down now. And now what I have to do is get in there and uh, pull all of this plastic that's uh, coming apart. You know, it's worn out and crumbling from uh, the row cover that was there. And there's some old soaker hose in there. I'll get all of that pulled out once I get the rest of the garden plowed. And then I'll come back and replow this area. And it'll look like it was never even there. And then I can do what I want. This is actually the location I'm slating, I mentioned earlier, to put our uh, attempt at growing Imperial Star artichokes here in southeast Georgia. We're going to give that a try. And this is the area that I've got slated to do that in. So we'll get more about that. I'm going to uh, rev the tractor back up and uh, plow the rest of this and then jump over to the other side of last year's garden and plow the whole front 40 of the garden. Okay, well, I've been working about 45 minutes or so on the tractor and I've gotten the whole back part plowed. That area that I showed you that was way overgrown is gone, except I still got to go in and clean it out. There's last year's garden. I plowed around it. Now, I've left that patch undisturbed at the end because I've got to put a uh, middle buster plow on the tractor and plow that area up with a uh, special plow tool I'll show you because I've got sweet potatoes in there. We're going to harvest those today. Uh, but you can see I've been working on this area, and if you look this way, you'll see it's way overgrown. It's about five foot tall with weeds, and there's a heavy layer of uh, undergrowth. This is where... Uh, marigolds were growing last year and sunflowers among other things and uh, we grow the marigolds in the garden and rotate them around the different areas because the marigolds help to get rid of nematodes. Nematodes are little beasties that live in your soil and they winter over and they uh, feast on the roots of your plants and cause the roots to be malformed which prevents the plant from taking up proper nutrients and producing a good crop. Also, it can cause all kinds of little warts and tubers on your potatoes and make them look kind of strange and funny. So uh, growing these marigolds in the garden, not only do they look nice, and they're also a pest deterrent because the oils and smells of the marigolds put off a lot of garden pests, but they get rid of nematodes. So uh, this area is overgrown. We're going to plow it in. Now, I'm using a technique that I call crush and run. I go across the row first, kind of shallow with the harrows, just letting them ride on top and they crush everything down and break it up because most of this is dry and brittle. And then I come back and two or three, I make about two to three passes per row, um, maybe as many as four, depending on how it's going. And uh, each time I drop the hairs a little deeper in the dirt for that pass to, uh, can, as I continue to break things down. If not, it all wants to ball up in front of the hairs and I have to keep stopping and raising the hairs and it creates these lumps, it's a pain in the neck. So uh, that's basically what it is, it's a process, but Imagine from back here all the way up here what I've done would have taken a guy with a, a mule and a hand plow and uh, walking behind a mule doing all that work. It would have taken all day to accomplish what I've done in under an hour. And I'm going to work my way to the front of the garden in the, in the next hour and wrap all of this up. Well, as you can see, this area here is overgrown. I've plowed most of the garden. You can see way on across the garden. We've plowed just about all of it. This little area here has a bunch of these drip tapes. I grew some corn in this area last year. The strawberries start right here and run back that way. And you can see we need to clean the strawberry patch up. That's this weekend. But uh, from right here, there's a, uh, a pipe that runs along here. It's kind of a manifold type pipe. You can see right here, it's a uh, pipe that's got a see the gauge of it there and it has a hose connector on it and then it has these twist locks that this uh, flat drip tape goes into. This drip tape comes on a big spool. You can order it in 500 foot or 250 foot or whatever you like and it's flat but uh, when it's under pressure it fills up with water and ever so often you can see one right here there's an emitter every four inches on this one. Some of them are every six inches and some of them are every uh, 12 inches. I think this one's more like six inches. But anyhow, these are reusable. So what I'm going to do is pull all of these out of here and then I'll plow this area in. Okay, well there's our cat, Maggie, coming in the frame. Right here is the strawberry patch. I mentioned it earlier and you'd think there is no strawberries there. It's completely overgrown with weeds. Why would you let it get so bad? Well, there's a rhyme and a reason to what we've done here. If I wade in here, pull the weeds back, you'll see that there are strawberry plants in here. 
there's some on the hills. You see that fabric? There's a hill. And there's a hill running down through here. There's like five or six hills right through here, right through this area here. There's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five hills. And one of the things I want you to notice is over here. See how green the grass is over here? It's the end of December, 1st of January. We shouldn't have green grass. This is centipede. It should be brown. We've had a little bit of a warm winter, but if you look over there to the front yard, see how brown it is? Same exact grass, centipede grass. Now the reason that grass is brown and this grass is green is because of heat. You see the piles of pine straw. I mowed here the other day and I blew all this pine straw from off the top of the grass to around the trees. This grass was covered with a nice thick layer of pine straw. That pine straw insulated, trapped enough heat to keep this centipede grass green, while over on the other side of the yard, where the grass is wide open and nothing to cover it, it turned brown. Same thing with these strawberries. We mat down in between the rows with fresh uh, straw hay to keep the weeds from growing, and we pull the weeds all summer. Once the fall comes, we let the weeds grow up and grow over the top of the strawberry beds and they act like a natural insulation to keep the strawberry plants from freezing during any hard freezes we might have. And then we clean the strawberry bed out in the late winter, early spring, and replant the little runners to give us young strawberry plants and the strawberries just keep on going. So there you go. That's why the strawberry, we're going to clean this bed up this weekend and I'll give you more information about what it takes to grow the strawberries, what runners are, and what we're doing to keep this bed going.